like this one. It's simple. He says, what are the manifest enlightened functions and dysfunctions of mass communicated surveillance or news, correlation or editorials, cultural transmissions and entertainment for society, subgroups, individuals, cultural systems. Okay, now this I think is a useful model because of its heuristic value, because of its research generating value. So if we were to try to uh, generate a research, if, if you had to write a paper, a short paper for some communication class, you might say, what are the functions of mass com communicated news for individuals in our society? Or you could say, what are the latent or unintended functions of mass communicated news for groups? Or you could say, uh, what are the unintended, or what are the intended dysfunctions? I mean, you know, you could answer all of this, but then you'd probably have a, a dissertation on your, you'd at least have a really long paper. Anyway, you might just ask yourself as you're thinking through it, can you use the model to generate three research questions? Because you can put them together in all kinds of combinations. What are the functions of, of cultural transmissions for society? Are there any dysfunctions to the cultural transmission for, to cultural transmissions for society? What are both the functions and the dysfunctions of mass communicated editorials to individuals? See how hey, you just keep recombining those and you come up with all sorts of different questions. Okay, it's Lazarsfeld, Lazarsfeld, who gives us the two-step flow model. And this is the one that says that information flows primarily from the media to opinion leaders. And it flows from the opinion leader. We have sound today. <laughs> We've kept it stifled on previous occasions. Okay, and that the information flows from the opinion leaders to their peers, to the people in their immediate communication environment. Okay, I think we answered this one before, but we're getting ready to think about McLuhan here in a minute. Why didn't people learn to read until the Middle Ages? Do you remember? Oh, maybe I need to ask it again. Okay, there weren't any books. The ones we did have were expensive. So how did people communicate? Okay, it was an oral tradition, right. And the invention of what reduced the price of books? The printing press. Okay, we'll come back to that again with McLuhan. Okay, diffusion of innovation theory. This is Everett Rogers and Shoemaker. And they're looking at how a new idea gets... I had some students help on sound effects here. Okay, how a new perceived idea moves from a point of origin through channels over time. Have you ever thought about that? You know, can you remember a world without microwave ovens? No. Okay, most of you can't. There are a few of us who can. You know, can you remember a world without TV? Most of you can't. No. Uh, can you remember a world without computers? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah, we're gonna. I, th I hope we have time. We'll do a little historical technology thing here in a minute. How many of you know what a hula hoop is? How many of you have one? Uh, you still got yours? <laughs> oh, it's your daughter's. Okay. Yeah. But see, that <laughs> we won't ask if you use it. Okay. Uh, you know, there are some things like microwaves that get diffused throughout society and they level off, and everybody has one, keeps one. Anybody got a Super Bowl? Anybody know what a Super Bowl is? Well, I don't know what is. Anybody? I don't know. They may have a new name. 
today. They're really hard, and however far you bounce them, they bounce back equally. You know, if, if you drop it 10 feet, it bounced back 10 feet. You drop it 20 feet, it bounced back 20. You could drop it off the roof of the house on the sidewalk. You know, well, I guess that's 20 feet. But anyway, uh, physics professor, I knew it. And this was, gee, 20 years ago, these were the rage. Uh, he took it up, I don't know, six flights of stairs or something and dropped it down the stairwell, and it shattered. So... <laughs> <laughs> they they did have their limit, you know, what they were doing. But anyway, those were like hula hoops. Those were the rage uh, for a while, nutty putty and that kind of uh, Some of those things come in and peak, and they're pretty much over. you know. But then other things diffuse, like PCs, and, and some variation is here to stay. Okay, of course, they keep upgrading them, so we have to spend more money and so forth. Okay, there are stages in innovation. First is stimulation. You have to get people interested in the new idea. How do you do that? Hmm? Yeah, advertisement, and that's back to the media again. How would you know that what the latest, you know, how would you know what a PT cruiser was? Well, unless, I mean, you might see one going down. In fact, I kind of did it backwards. I saw one before I saw it advertised. But then I was going, what is that thing? <laughs> what was that, you know, that just went by? Uh, but then you notice the advertising. Okay. But there's the initiation then of the idea as it spreads into the system through advertising as people start to buy them and so forth and, and they catch on, whether it's new Volkswagen Beetles or, uh, like I said, PT Cruisers or uh, I want a Hummer. Anybody got a Hummer? I want to go around the block and I want a red Hummer. It won't fit in the driveway though, so I have to work on that. Okay, you know, but we haven't always had Hummers. You know, the military introduced them first, and then I don't know where the transition point was that people started painting them really cute colors and driving them down the freeway. Uh, but anyway, new ideas get adopted over time and so forth. Uh, there's legitimation of the idea by the power holders. Remember we talked about Weber, we talked about legitimation of authority. And, and you as the consumer decide whether something is legitimate or not. How do you do that? Buy it. Yeah, good answer. You buy it and you keep it and you use it. And you make your friends jealous and they all want one too. Yeah, but no, that's the legitimation comes from the consumer, by the people who hold the power. And so the decision to act ultimately rests then with the social system. And the action is the actual execution step where you buy the vehicle or go for the product or whatever it may be. Okay, there's going to be a decision-making phase which involves the knowledge of the innovation, persuasion, you're persuaded to use it, a decision to accept it or reject it, and then in the implementation phase you communicate that decision, yes, I will sign on the dotted line, I will take the vehicle, I will buy the product. Oh. and and. Usually, not usually, but also it's often at the organizational level. The city buys a set of police cars or fire trucks or uh, decides to put fluoride in the water or whatever. But anyway, the final step then is that action stage where you either adopt or, or reject sometimes uh, the innovation. And this is done by the adoption unit, whether it's one person or... Uh, the city council acting on behalf of the whole city. Now the innovations actually fall into three categories as far as being types of decisions. Some things are optional, some are, some are collective, and some are done by authority. The authority decisions are the fastest. The boss says it's going to be this way. 
years ago, the pres a president of the university, pre uh, President Van Horn, most of you don't know, decided we were going to be computerized. You know, and monies were found and channeled and so forth. So that within just, I don't know, a couple of years, I think, you know, there were computers all over this campus. And we stepped into the computer age. Seems like it was back in the early 80s, but I've forgotten now. Okay. Some things are optional, uh, like a physician's decision about which drug to prescribe. You know, they have lots of choices of antihistamines and antibiotics and painkillers and so forth. So which one will it be? And have you noticed the trend in, in recent months, the last couple of years, for the pharmaceutical companies to advertise their product on television? Now, why would they do that if the doctor's the one prescribing the drug? I can't hear you. So you can request it. Okay, they want you to go in and put pressure on your physician because of what, what are they trying to do with those ads? Well, they're trying to persuade you, but how, at what level? What are they doing to you cognitively? See, think about, and it depends on which drug, but think about what they're telling you about those drugs. Their ability to fight allergies, their ability to lower cholesterol, their ability to fight and conquer and deal with whatever the issue at hand is. They want you to believe that. And how does the, the emotional component come into it? And then you start feeling that it's better for you or it'll help you. Yeah, and you want to save the life of someone in your family, don't you? Or make them less miserable in allergy season, whatever. But, but the, the, the cognitive part comes in in trying to get you to believe certain things about these drugs. And, of course, they have to mention the side effects, but, you know, those are always really small and very quickly done. But if you listen to some of those, I'm going, no, I think I'd rather just sneeze, thank you very much, <laughs> or whatever else the problem is. Yeah. So, but sometimes it works, you know, and I, and I believe in the product, and other times I go, oh, no, I don't think so. Okay, but they're trying to change your cognitive component. They're trying to change, yes, sir, hold your mic down, too. Does it have something to do with name recognition? Like you get this problem or, or this, these symptoms and then immediately you start thinking of what those, like name recognition of what products might help mm -hmm. you. Instead of like they're trying to persuade you that it works, it just... Yeah, I've decided I'm depressed and by the way, there's a new drug that can fix that. Yeah, and they're, and they're hoping that you'll remember that product identification. And the product identification goes with all advertising. You know, whether it's you're standing there trying to pick a deodorant out of 50 on the shelf or what kind of shampoo or toothpaste and so forth. And, and so the recognition part is an important part of that. But same thing with the drugs because they're hoping that you'll ask your physician because he does or she does have a choice. Mine's a guy. Uh, but they do have a choice about what they prescribe for you, and that's one of those optional things. Okay, the third type is collective. There are some things we have to do as a group. We either do or don't put fluoride in our city water. But you can't have it at your house and you not have it at your house. Now, you know, you can buy a, a water purification system and hook that up in your kitchen or whatever, but there's some things that we have to decide as a group. Now we may have, uh, often it's city council who does that for us because they're our elected representatives and we trust them. I think we trust them? Yeah, so we trust them. Okay. Uh, but then there are other things that require a referendum, that require a vote of the people, maybe in the neighborhood or in the city, whether it's involving light rail or uh, sports stadiums or whether or not to change the deed restrictions throughout your subdivision, some of those kinds of things. So the decisions fall into three categories, optional,
collective authority. Okay, we turn to our last theorist, but we still got a little way to go in lecture notes today because there's a second PowerPoint show we're going to look at. Um, this is our last big theorist. We'll also look at cultivation theory after and some related concepts after we look at McLuhan. Okay, Marshall McLuhan, pretty cool guy. He was publishing back in the 60s, 70s, died a few years, maybe 10 years ago. I lose track of these things. Anyway, he's no longer with us, and that's kind of sad. I mean, you hate for anybody to die, but uh, it's kind of sad because we've had such a technological revolution. And, and the whole point of his theory, in fact, his theory is entitled Technological Determinism because he's interested in how technology has changed society throughout the ages. How technology has changed society throughout the ages. Now, this is called an artistic historical approach because a lot like you know, Aristotle didn't do quantitative research. He just kind of walked around under the trees and, or sat by the seashore or whatever he did and thought things through. Well, McLuhan wasn't doing great quantitative studies that ran the computers crazy. He simply observed the world about him, uh, was well informed about history, and drew some conclusions about what he perceived as a result of that. So he's interested in communication effects, what effect the medium, and medium is singular, media is plural. He was interested in what effect the medium has on people, and, and we'll come back to that shortly. I think I mentioned in lecture one, beginning of the semester, obviously, that the shortest definition of communication that I'm aware of is McLuhan's, and he defined communication as information transportation, whether it's an advertisement moving from the packaging to your brain, or whether it's one computer hooked up to another. Uh, there are all kinds of ways, you know, plants, dolphins, honeybees, computers, advertising. There are many ways that information can be transported from one place to another. There, I just You don't have to remember for test purposes the books, but if you're ever uh, looking in the half-price bookstore or want to go check something out of the library, his books are actually fun reading, I think. Uh, the two earliest ones are Mechanical Bride and Gutenberg Galaxy. Uh, we've referred in here today and a couple of times in the past about how the printing press the Gutenberg Press, transforms society into a literate society. And that's the first big communication effect that he notes. You know, because that, that was a major transformation from, a, from an oral to a written society. And literacy became the norm. Okay? Uh, then in Mechanical Bride, the focus is on uh, the urbanization, and we briefly talked about that in a previous class, but how late 1800s, 1900, the turn of the century, uh, the migration of the people to the cities, how we changed as a culture from an agrarian uh, to an urbanized technological, at least at the time, uh, society because of the factories, assembly lines, and so forth. Okay, when he published Understanding Media, and I think that was either 1967 or 68, and Medium is the, and that one has a play on it. I put Medium as the massage up here. On the title of the book it says, The Medium is the Message, and then there's a line drawn through the E of message and an A written on the top of it to suggest that the medium is the message, but it also massages your mind as the message. And the medium, he would say, is the important part. Well, we were just moving into, you know, in the 60s, this technological revolution. 
But even at that point, advertising had changed. Uh, he was noting effects of those running neon lights that you used to see a lot of on motels and things, and those are kind of passe now in a lot of places, most places, so forth. But anyway, these are some of the books that he's written, and they're fun. The Medium is the Message is particularly fun because it has lots of pictures in it. And he talks about how the media serve as extensions of our senses. I think I'm jumping ahead. That's number two. Whoops. Okay. Uh, well, let me go ahead and talk about that one, and we'll come back to the other. Uh, but he'll say, for example, and typewriters were the in thing then. We didn't have computers. So he said the typewriter is an extension of your fingers. Your glasses or contacts or glasses, are extensions of your eyes. See, because they make your eyes work better. The typewriter does things for your fingers. Uh, everything from bicycles to automobiles, even roller skates, would be extensions of your feet. And so why then, in this line of thinking, why would the computer be so exciting? What's it an extension of? Not of everything, of your mind, of your brain. It's an extension of your brain. It can calculate faster than you can. It can remember more than you can. It can integrate lots of that. You know, there's some things it can't do, obviously. But, but there are many of the brain functions of humans that the computer can surpass. And so that made it a very exciting and stimulating extension of our senses. Okay, let me go back to number one there. He said the media can be classified as either hot or cool. Hot or cool. And, and a hot medium is one that bombards your senses. And there's low participation on your part because you just kind of sit there and soak it up. It's kind of like uh, a good example is going to the movie theater with one of the big screens. Well... You know, it's not the same watching Jurassic Park on the video on the home TV as it is on the big screen or Titanic or Water World, any of these really uh, good special effects movies. You know, you can enjoy them and if oh, you may have a large TV at home, but still it's not the same as, as the wraparound sound. And, and I know that often when I go to the theater to watch the movie, when I come back out into the real world, there's a kind of moment or two of disorientation. You have that feeling? Okay, some of you, Luke, I'm not in this alone. Okay, you know, it's kind of like, oh yeah, this is the world that I came out of because I've been so stimulated, so transformed in that experience. That doesn't happen at home, even with the DVD. I like the DVD, you know, it's clearer, it's sharper, it's nice. Uh, but there, but still, you're, I'm aware, unless it's a really engrossing story, I'm aware of the other things that are going on around me. And if the telephone rings or, you know, the cat jumps where he's not supposed to be and so forth. So anyway, McLuhan said there are cool media and there are hot media. And the hot ones have this high bombardment of your senses with what he would call very complete sensory data. The cool media, or a cool medium, whichever way you want to say it, would be something like television because you have to work. You have to be involved in it and participate in order to get it all. You know, on the TV screen, you're looking really at those little pixels of color, and if you enlarged it enough, then you'd start to get a distortion of the image. So you're having to work and participate in order to put those colors together like a, a jigsaw puzzle, kind of. But, you know, you have to work and your brain has to assimilate that information. So there's low sense, relatively speaking, there is low sensory data and there's higher participation on your part. Okay, would, is radio high or low bombardment? Okay, could be either one, but usually the way most of us play it, it would come under hot or high bombardment. You know, especially in your automobile when it's turned up on blast and the whole car is rocking as it goes down the road, 
whether it's the stereo or the radio. If it's more like uh, music, elevator music, then it's low stimulation. It's just kind of in the background. It's in your peripheral routing. Newspaper, magazines. Well, McLuhan would say those are hot because you have to focus and really get absorbed in it to read it. So I don't know, we won't go through and try to classify uh, everything today, but uh, it's worth thinking about and, and your level of involvement and absorption uh, in that. But he would say that, that radio is hot, uh, film is hot, books are hot if it's a good book, if it's a boring book putting you to sleep, that's a different deal. Uh, your textbooks, you know, but that the television is cool because there's, there's low data coming in. Okay, we also got from McLuhan this notion of the global village. The global village, that the, because of satellite communication and, you know, international hookups and all that sort of thing, that the size of the world is shrinking where it used to take weeks or months for a letter to get from the United States, from America, to England or to Europe. You know, now things are, are well, at his writing, things were moving uh, much, much faster via satellite. Now we've got email and other things, and, and things are even more personal and more information is moving, as we'll touch on in a minute. But anyway, he gives us the term of global village. Now, there are still societies that are out of touch, that are not technologically advanced, that don't have television, that don't have cable and satellite access and so forth. So those would not be included in this. But the many parts of the world that are, are part of this shrinking world, global village kind of notion. Okay, Gerbner gives us uh, what, what he calls cultivation theory, and it picks up the metaphor from uh, the farmer who grows something, okay? And he says that somebody, that, you know, you cultivate a field and then you get a crop of some sort. Well, he says that, <clears throat> and gives us this model, that someone perceives and reacts in a situation through some means to make available in some form and in some content, conveying content, of some consequences. And that through all of this, we get these transformations that take place. We get new perceptions, and we've already been talking about uh, the cognitive changes and so forth. Uh, but the media cultivates those things. It cultivates your interest in... Uh, music videos. It cultivates your interest in sports. It cultivates your interest in learning. It cultivates your interest in shopping. Whatever. Um, and, and people see these things that we perceive what the media is sending and uh, that impacts then the way that we react in the situation. And he reminds us, it's from him that we get, the, well, and some other guys, Wesley McLean, who have a model that we haven't looked at. But they both use the concept of the gatekeeper, you know, the, the idea that the media holds back all this, just tons and tons of information. And remember, under organizational communication, we talked about uh, absolute information and distributed information. Well, the, the media, you know, the major networks, particularly uh, the large media organizations, I'll put it that way, have all of, they, have, they, may, they don't have all the information in the world, but their pool of absolute information is enormous compared to what they let through the gates. If you use the metaphor for the floodgates letting X and cubic feet of water over the dam at any point in time. Uh, they let some of that information out to you, and then they set the agenda. I think that's on my next slide here. Uh, we've got some related concepts. Let's kind of take a look at these together. Uh, along the line of cultivation theory, 
Another term that's been used with that is stalagmite theory. And I don't know who actually coined that phrase. If you discover it somewhere, you can send me an email and let me know. Uh, but stalagmite theory says that the media effects build up over time. You know, that watching two violent cartoons is not going to do you in. Maybe watching 10 violent cartoons doesn't matter. Maybe you can watch 200. But somewhere, the theory says, along the line, over time, the effects are going to build up. And you're going to start to absorb the values of the people that you watch most often on TV, whether it's through your sitcoms or your soap operas or religious channels or, you know, it can be good, it can be bad, and good and bad depends on your point of view and and what you value, okay? But the, the media effects will build up over a period of time, just like the stalagmites uh, build up on the floor of a cave. The mites go up and the tights go down. Somebody tell me. Okay, okay we've talked briefly before about mean world syndrome, but this is that idea that, you know, you, you watch enough uh, bad news on television or here on radio or read I, I tend to be a television person so I say that more often perhaps than I should uh, but if whether it's reading the newspaper or listening to it on radio we get so many reports of bad news of catastrophes that we start to think that the whole world is falling apart or that it's a really mean world out there and that's the premise of this concept, that, that you think the world is mean because that's basically what you hear. And most people don't sit around exposing themselves regularly to the good news, you know, to watching It's a Miracle every time it comes on, or I don't know, what, whatever else. You might, I'm, I'm trying to think what else actually reports good news. Uh, many of the networks have at least human interest stories, some touching something of animals who were rescued or a person who was rescued. Or, uh, there's more of an attempt, I think, to do that than perhaps there was a few years ago. Okay, agenda setting we've talked about before, but the, and it's an important concept because as the gates open and the information flows through, somebody has to decide for you what the important information is. Well, I don't guess they have to, but they take it upon themselves to decide what the important information is. And how do they do that? How do, when you turn the news on tonight, how will you know, if you turn on the TV or the radio, how will you know, in the opinion of the network, what the most important thing that happened today is? Okay, it'll be the top story. If it's more important than the top story, what does it become? Breaking news. Yeah, and every once in a while they make that judgment call, we need to interrupt your game show, your soap opera, your whatever, in order to bring you breaking news. <clears throat> Why do they do that? Say it again and hold the mic down. They want you to know about it right then and there. They want okay. you to know the They believe, of it. don't they, that, that you need to know about it right then. It may involve, usually it's a safety issue, but sometimes it's just a really good, gory, gutsy story that they think you'll be fascinated by, and so you'll stay tuned to their network or whatever. And they want to be there first, so you'll call all your friends and say, Channel X has this on, but Y and Z aren't covering it. So they get you hooked on their channel first. Okay, gatekeeping, we've already talked about. Uh, entertainment theory is not a real, oh, this is about all there is to it, but it, it simply notes that the media provides a major source of entertainment. 
You didn't know that, did you? But, you know, it's, it's one of those things like people like beautiful surroundings better than ugly surroundings. Okay? Somebody needed to write it down and say, yeah, we actually recognize that an important function of the media is entertainment. And that there are a number of varieties of entertainment that not all people like the same thing. Some of you want sitcoms, you know, others want dramatic stories, on and on, and that there's variety within that. Okay, any question about this material? Well, I get some other stuff up here. Okay, this is the last thing we're going to look at. Let's so get it going. Is a fun presentation that some of my students put together last semester. Oh, see if you recognize any of these guys: Edwards, Kinsella, Greenwood, and Sohani. But they they were doing a project in another class unrelated to this one. But they they got some interesting stuff here, and it's kind of appropriate, I think, it almost a salute to Marshall McLuhan to. Uh, go back through and do a little bit of historical review to look at how things have changed, particularly in the last 30 years. We won't try to take our timeline back, you know, all the way to classical Greece and trace it to the present. That's beyond what we need to do. Um, but for some of you, you weren't even born when some of these things were happening. For others of us, the line becomes kind of fuzzy as we try to know, well, what year did that happen? And, you know, how, before I pulled the date up on here, did any of you ever do research? Oh, pretty young group out there. Uh, or maybe you knew someone, you've heard people talk about doing research with the old cards that you had to punch. Have you even heard of that? Okay, uh, no, young group up here. Okay, but research show oh, 20, 25 years ago, you had all this punch card stuff. That we'll come back to that. Okay. About 1971 is when Intel introduced the first microprocessor chip. Okay. And this, and we won't, I won't read you everything that's up here. Uh, you can pull these up and look at them in more detail if you want to. But this laid the foundation for coming up with powered calculators and putting intelligence in inanimate objects, uh, which includes ultimately the personal computer. Okay, how many of you know what a slide rule is? Yeah, okay, we got half a dozen or so in here at least. How many of you ever used one? Okay, a couple. I've hauled mine proudly off to physics class as an undergraduate and never did quite get the hang of logarithms. I never really knew what I needed them for. You know. but, but there was a generation, many generations, who hauled their slide rules around and, and used them faithfully. They became obsolete. When's the last time you saw a slide rule? You have one in your life these days? Um, my high school calculus teacher, he actually made us use one one day. This is for fun? For the experience. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. And he wanted us, he just wanted to show us how much easier calculators are than we had to use. Yeah. And I couldn't use one now if I had to. It just, you know, that information's gone. Okay, so uh, one of the earlier was the HP 80 sold for $395. The important thing was that you could do all kinds of things on that calculator from amortization, interest rates. Uh, time value calculations with money. There are just lots of things that that calculator can do besides add and subtract, particularly if you're good with it. Okay, we salute the big inventors here. Oddly enough, uh, of course, everybody knows Gates because he's on TV so much. Uh, I should have held Paul Allen's name back to see if you even could remember it. But he's the co-founder of Microsoft. And these guys, you know, are billionaires now and have revolutionized uh, the software and, and hardware industries. Okay, um, here's the old Altair 8800. Uh, the, I don't even know if I ever saw one of those because speech majors move in different circles. 
but it came with a do-it-yourself kit and in January of 75 according to Popular Electronics it was the in thing okay and they, along there and shortly thereafter is when people were doing these uh, punch cards with binary system oh 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 one 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 oh one oh one oh one you know and, and you had to grid all these things in and then the machines punched them out and uh, all the data on your subjects was coded you know if maybe uh, males were zero and females were one and uh, then your age groups under 21 would get a zero 21 to 30 would get a one 31 to 50 got a two you know all that stuff was coded but you had to punch out uh, actual cards and then the computer as it were, scanned that information. Okay, then new markets began. New companies, new technologies. And those included things like your telephone service, your cable television, uh, video rentals, <laughs> personal computers. You know, but, but these companies, well AT&T has been around forever. But, but you think about, uh, you know, Time Warner. How long have they been big players on the scene? You know, mostly recently. Okay. And all your online services. Okay. You know, how long have these folks been on the stock exchange? Mm, 10 to 20 years. See, I can't even remember now who Blockbuster bought out. You remember? And my daughter worked there. <laughs> One of them, you know. And, but it's it's a blank because they've they've taken over. But so see how the the new technology has impacted society. And one of the ways that it impacted is through the development of all these new companies. And it wasn't just the, uh, an idea like literacy or urbanization. I mean, the, the, the media impact is not necessarily limited to one particular area. Okay, some of the new technologies. They like PCs a lot. Uh, PCs, th th think about uh, these words weren't even in my vocabulary in graduate school. Of course, I know I'm really, really old. As the little kid said, you know, older than dirt. Okay, but, but new to our vocabulary. So not only are there new companies and, and the new challenges that go with these, uh, but we have all kinds of new words that are added to our vocabulary. Mouse, CD, Internet, PC, CD-ROM, and so forth. Okay, as we move into the 1990s, even more things began to happen. Uh, the cell phone industry took off. Now, I can remember, well, I don't know what year, probably 10 years ago, uh, talking to a band teacher at an elementary school. When cell phones were kind of, you know, the people with the money are really into fads who ran their charge cards up. They were two types that were walking around with cell phones 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, but I remember the band teacher at an elementary school telling me, won't be long until every person in this country is walking around carrying a cell phone. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Uh-huh, I'm going to do that. You know, I'm getting along just that. Remember the, the ignorance fallacy? You know, I got along just fine without it. What makes me think I need it? I got my cell phone, too, just like everybody else. Okay. Internet usage skyrocketed, uh, increased bandwidths for the internet became important, more people bought computers, and with that came the ease of global communication. You know, you can email all over, well, almost all over the world, but many places throughout the world now. Uh, was there a downside to any of this? What was it? Ta-da! I should have had a big drum roll with that one. Loss of privacy. Okay, loss of privacy. You know, 
people are get, we'll look at that again in just a second. Okay, the <laughs> cell phone industry took off uh, with improved hardware, new features available to users, and we won't go into all those, most of you already have them, wider coverage areas, uh, they upgraded to digital technologies. Okay, the internet usage skyrocketed. Must have been Kate Kennedy. Okay. E e uh, okay. <laughs> Almost spoke to Tim. Okay, email stormed the world. Uh, richer content became available. Uh, the user embraced the internet as a major source for information. And companies had trouble keeping up with demand. And free ISPs start up. Bandwidth again, just some of the things that developed. And all of this uh, resulted in better stuff coming to you over the internet. Better streaming, better video. And so, more people bought computers. And so in the 90s, the more people buying computers meant the cost went down. Probably not low enough for some of us, it still usually is a bite, but still, a lower cost on hardware, more features, faster hardware, uh, it's more user friendly, a more portable notebook computers created. You, find, you know, it's taken a while because they're expensive, but you got more people hauling their laptops around with them. Okay, the ease of global communication increased. Oh, there's the reference to email again. Instant messaging, uh, internet phones using streaming audio, letting people talk around the world. And generally, people are, unless you turn your phone off, people are available at all times. Okay? Oh, there are some places and times like test and classroom, but those need to be turned off. But again, what's, what's the downside of this? Okay, loss of privacy is still a problem. Because in the 90s, can you think of how privacy was even further lost? Okay, well you sometimes have hidden cameras becoming popular, employee, employers or companies are, are placing those cameras to see if their employees are actually working or if they're sitting there playing on the internet all day at the office. And I know some secretaries who do that. Oh, uh, I guess we should keep them busy. Under, although it is entertaining, you know, if, if you're in an underload situation. Okay, so they're hidden cameras. They're more surveillance cameras. Sometimes they're not hidden. They're just out there. Uh, webcams are popular you can afford them, but uh, that is a loss of privacy. And again, uh, people are more, probably always is an overstatement, but people are more readily available than they've been. Okay, just uh, overshoot one. Okay. Uh, the software development in the 90s, Windows by Microsoft, <clears throat> of course, has been the major a revolution in software. Can you even remember word processing before Microsoft Office? Anybody remember WordStar? Good. Oh, wasn't that thing a pain? You know, so many commands trying to control W for this and control L for that and control P for something else. And, you know, and I always had to have a little chart there and that, that part of my life didn't last very long and I'm grateful for that. Okay. On the internet, we got the emergence of the web browsers like Gopher and Mosaic and Netscape and Internet Explorer. Uh, if you're really interested in this growth, then I encourage you to uh, pull uh, these figures up off of WebCT and just look at the growth. You can see on there that it's skyrocketed. But there's some interesting data in there that we don't have time uh, to go over in here. But the point being, internet hosts have really taken off and zoomed 
uh, since October of 90, which is where this chart starts. And this is through October of 2000, because the guys were putting this together in probably February of 2001. <clears throat> That'll be relevant 10 years from now when this poor old tape is still playing and they're going, why don't they have more relevant data up there? Okay, the arrival of electronic mail uh, became even, even though we've had it for quite a while, the fact that everybody's taking their laptop around and you can plug in at the airport or any place you can, you know, get a good connection. Uh, you can just access things more easily than uh, you've been able to. Okay, a lot of socialization occurred on the internet. Okay, how many of you are in chat rooms of one sort or another? No? Well, that's a pretty busy group this summer. Oh, and that may be more a high school phenomenon. Yeah, I'm seeing some hits. Yeah, I don't have time for chat rooms. But, but I know some people, that, teens especially, who log on regularly. Okay, and anyway, there's some references to that. How many people play games? Okay, and whether you play games, and I do, uh, I don't, I'm not to the point that I connect my computer to somebody else's and we do this back and forth stuff, but whether, whether you're gaming with someone else at the same time, which is one form of socialization, or uh, whether you're simply using it as, as a party activity, you know, you've got a group at your house or apartment, uh, it may provide a, a hub for the people who aren't doing something else, eating or whatever. Okay, need to keep moving. E-commerce, as you well know, has really boomed in the last 10 years, particularly in the last five. Whoops, that should be through, not trough. I thought I got all the typos in this. Okay, the majority of companies started conducting, here's the, it's correct on my hard copy. <laughs> How much, I must have saved it after I corrected it. Okay, but anyway, uh, all the things that you can do online, shopping and purchasing e-commerce wise. Here's another chart, and hopefully it's correct, that traces from June 96 through September of 2000 that lets you know and, and kind of have a visual representation of how uh, the Internet websites have grown in the last 10 years. So a few of them have gone under, too, but still uh, taking into account the, the number that have failed, the, the website, there's still just a tremendous mushrooming of websites uh, beyond the capability of even surfing them all. Okay, and the other important thing that's happening, and many of you are doing this even with this course, is education through the Internet. Uh, uh, distance education years ago meant teaching the class somewhere other than on the central campus. You know, and I even taught a few classes over at the medical center and it fell under the umbrella of distance ed. Woo, four miles away or whatever it is. Okay, but all the courses now that are on there are making it possible for you to get college degrees and so forth and if you're new to this, then uh, you ought to be looking in that part of your registration catalog just to see how many choices uh, you actually have in there because there are a wide variety of degrees and programs that are available to you. So the question is, as these fellows raise, are we indeed in the beginning of a new era in civilization? You know. Uh, we certainly know that the, <laughs> there comes our snail across, uh, that the mail system has changed dramatically. The post office, of course, is uh, suffering financial repercussions uh, from that. But whether it's in mail, in education, uh, in consumer consumption, in advertising, uh, from Marshall McLuhan's point of view, he would probably say, yes, indeed, uh, we are on the edge of a new civilization. And that makes it a pretty exciting time. And it's kind of a fun place to leave this course uh, as we finish in the next minute or so, uh, the last of the taping of the lectures that go with this. 
I hope that for most of you, uh, I know that for many of you, and, and I hope for most, that this course has served as a foundation course. I've got a few people who today, and I'm sure in the future, will be taking it in their last semester as the last thing they do uh, before they get out of the university. Uh, but it's designed as a foundation course, and there are many more courses within uh, the University of Houston School of Communication, as well as other universities around the country that offer full courses that specialize in areas that you may think we've touched on them in depth, but that take what we've covered in two to four hours and spend a whole semester on that. Uh, here at U of H, uh, I often teach it, other people sometimes do, there's a whole course in interpersonal communication. There's a course in organizational communication, uh, cross-cultural communication, television and the family, gender roles in the media. You know, there are just all kinds of areas where what we've done is survey the theoretical approaches that are fundamental to those areas, but hopefully now you're grounded, and if you've done this your freshman year like you're supposed to, then you've got the theoretical foundation so that you're ready to move on to uh, those upper division classes and apply that theory in, a theory in an area uh, with a pragmatic application and a much more detailed study of that. So I thank you for your attention and wish you well.